I would describe recovery as, you know, I mean, yeah, I have a bunch of setbacks and I was afraid I was going to be judged for, you know, a lot of the things that I was engaged in that wasn't healthy for me, you know, whether that's, you know, drugs or certain people. But Fun House became that community for me where, you know, we understand, you know, where you're at right now and we meet people where you're at. We understand that it's a process. It does not mean that you're not in recovery. One of the first things I learned uh, in my Recovery Coach Academy training, they define recovery as when you say you are, not, you know, the clinician, not, not even anybody else from the clubhouse. Like you define when you are in recovery. That's very powerful that I can define, you know, my own recovery, even if I slip up. That's powerful. Greetings, friends. This is Carrie Morrison, and welcome to Heart Forward Conversations from the Heart. Almost seven years ago in the summer of 2017, as a Stanton Fellow granted the opportunity to explore innovations and best practices in the mental health space, I toured Fountain House. I stopped in New York City as an interim step on my way to Trieste for the first time. I remember everything about this visit from the moment I walked into the front door on West 47th Street. I was so warmly greeted by people who were clearly waiting for me and was given a tour of the house by a member who took me to every nook and cranny. I saw such a bustle of activity, different rooms with people working collaboratively, people at computers, people gathered around tables in discussion, people busy preparing a meal. It was unlike anything I had seen before and certainly unlike anything that existed for people living in Los Angeles with a mental illness. When I describe this now, I use the word joy to describe what I witnessed. On that summer trip, I had the occasion also to visit Trieste, and anyone who listens to this podcast knows that that experience was a game changer. When I returned to Los Angeles after those two experiences, I knew I had witnessed something that we had to pay attention to. And it is no accident that I have heard it said, and I am still trying to find something in writing to attest to this, that the city of Trieste has been described as a clubhouse without walls and Fountain House as Trieste within walls. I think that relates to the emphasis on recognizing the needs of the whole person and caring for what matters to that person in a community and recognizing that recovery can be rooted in non-clinical practices. And the study that Fountain House has just released validates this with sound research that documents the cost savings associated with investing in something like the clubhouse model. So please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Josh Seidman and one of Fountain House's members, the Reverend Dr. Philip Fleming. Well, good morning. I am really happy to have in my studio here today via Zoom two of our friends from Fountain House in New York City, the Reverend Dr. Philip Fleming, who is on the Fountain House board and has had a great experience with uh, the clubhouse as a member and part-time staff, and also Dr. Joshua Seidman, who's the Chief Research and Knowledge Officer for Fountain House. And we're here today because Fountain House recently released a very important and informative report that we want to bring to everyone's attention, particularly anyone who's interested to know about the impact of the clubhouse model in the community of people being served with mental illness, but also policymakers, uh, local, state, and federal, especially in California, where we are really trying to elevate the clubhouse model as a critical asset to have in community-based mental health. And the name of the, the study that's been released is called Beyond Treatment, How Clubhouses for People Living with Serious Mental Illness Transform Lives and Save Money. So we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into this research and uh, hope, hopefully draw people to look into it more deeply. Let me first of all introduce our two guests today. Phil, could you please give us a little insight into your origin story? I understand you're on the board for Fountain House, but I would love to know how you became acquainted with and connected to the clubhouse and, and what your role is. Well, I used to attend a support group in Manhattan for LGBTQ uh, folks living with serious mental illness. And it was the summer of 2013 that one of those group members, who was a Fountain House member at the time, told me about Fountain House, and he felt that it would be uh, a good fit for me. Now, at that time, 
because I didn't receive mental health services in Manhattan, I think that was one of the criteria for membership at that time. This guy became my sponsor, and thus I was able to get in you know, as a member. And my first day was November 1st, 2013. And I have to say the rest is history. My experience has been tremendous. It's awesome. It's not treatment. It's more like, hey, I have a set of skills that I can cultivate, you know, with support from social practitioners, other members, and other staff, the way that they uh, structure the clubhouse model. So I was able to uh, excel in my own, you know, talents, but also uh, picked up some new skills and things like that. And that eventually uh, led me to get state certified. Then from there, it got me on uh, the board of directors as of May 2022. So that's the short end of it. Congratulations on on that, uh, Phil. And when you say state certified, are you talking about your role as a certified peer specialist? Uh, Yes, I am. Um, So there's a couple of different uh, peer certifications in New York State. I have two of them. One is uh, is certified peer specialist, and that's through uh, a curriculum called the Academy of Peer Services and the New York Peer uh, Specialist Certification Board. And then the other one is addiction recovery or the certified recovery peer advocate uh, certification, which is through uh, OASIS, uh, the Office of Addiction Services and Supports. Don't you love it? Just another acronym that we all have to try to memorize. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Josh, so tell us a a bit about your origin story and how you found your way to Fountain House. Yeah, well, I um, am reasonably new to the behavioral health world, uh, only the last five years or so. Um, I spent a long time in healthcare settings. And a lot of it was because I have spent a lot of time directly observing clinicians and patients in healthcare settings doing a lot of work in human-centered design. And I found that uh, one of the things that is really unique about Fountain House, you know, Phil said, this is not treatment. And when I went to Fountain House, the things, the two things that I noticed immediately were one, that unlike a hospital or a clinic, people really want to be there, right? So that's really different than those kinds of treatment settings. And then the second thing that is really apparent when you go there is you cannot tell who is staff and who are members. And I think that's pretty remarkable. You know, nobody is in white coats, nobody's in scrubs, nobody's got name tags, and everybody's just engaged in the work of the house together. So that really appealed to me. Um, the second thing that really appealed to me is over my 30 plus years in healthcare, I, I've sort of grown um, weary of what we're doing in terms of all the mending we're, all the money we're spending on health care that's not really transforming health and um, really found that Fountain House figured out 75 years before the rest of us that we really need to address these social drivers of health. And that's something that, uh, you know, I think is really critically important. And really the, the model, again, Phil said, you know, he said, I have a set of skills. And th- that's sort of the point, right? Uh, we take a very strengths focused approach and um, and build off of people's skills. And because we're able to maximize the strengths that each person brings to the clubhouse, whether a member or a staff person, it means that we sort of get that much more impact out of it. Um, and then the other piece of this is just personal. You know, I, I have four kids and, and uh, you know, that really, one of my kids really struggled um, with mental health challenges and you know, I just decided that whatever possible skills I have, I wanted to try to use to fix our broken mental health care system. And um, Fountain House really has been, uh, is now really, I think, leading the way in terms of community-based solutions to try to do that. That's excellent. And, you know, it. we have been so inspired by the work of Fountain House for years. And, uh, and, I, and I will say, um, that we here in Los Angeles are working with Fountain House to stand up the first clubhouse in Southern California in Hollywood, and we're in partnership with you about about that. And so, um, Phil, let me let me turn to you for a moment because as we've been doing this work in Los Angeles, cultivating 
um, interest in the clubhouse, potential funders, uh, uh, and, and the future members, it's really a foreign concept in, in Southern California. There, there's only a couple accredited clubhouses in the full state, but for some reason, the clubhouse movement passed Los Angeles region by. So for people listening to this, to this podcast, can you describe in, in your own words, what is a clubhouse? So I will describe a clubhouse as an engagement of people from many different backgrounds and experiences uh, coming together. Uh, and I think the common goal is improvement of quality of life. Um, and I always tell people that, you know, what works for one person may not work for an another person. I think the clubhouse model recognizes that. Uh, as Josh said earlier, uh, you know, front house and, and the clubhouse model is a strength based model where there's no focus on, you know, what's wrong with you. You know, we don't even say things like that. It's what happened to us and how we can take what happened to us, uh, and, you know, improve our own quality of life and the people around us, whether it be, uh, friends or, or strangers. Um, so the accreditation uh, piece, and I'll be very brief about this, is, uh, you know, through Clubhouse International, uh, they have a set of Clubhouse standards uh, that are really centered around the the core values and principles uh, of peer support, one of them being uh, strength-based. Uh, but the, the, uh, the standard that I like the most, uh, and this is one of the first ones I heard that first week I was at, found a house and it goes something like, and I quote, uh, there are no member only spaces. There are no staff only spaces, unquote. And, you know, for me, that's very important uh, to hear those words because it tells me that, hey, you know, just my very presence at found a house is very important to everyone that is that is there. And so, you know, I really took that to heart. Um, you know, 11 years later, uh, you know, that still holds true. So, Phil, can you describe for me, because there's a lot of people right now in Los Angeles with our our little, we call it the pop-up clubhouse while Fountain House is working to um, prepare the, the staff team that they will be bringing to, to open up a, a fully functioning clubhouse. But we have about 20 people who are showing up as as kind of the initial inaugural members, but they're going to go out and start to recruit other members from other places in the community. And when you think about your first week or so, how would you describe this? Because some people may be listening to this like, gosh, they keep telling me I should go check this thing out, but it sounds really strange. Um, and I often say this is not a drop-in center. It's not like anything that exists right now in LA. So when you think back to your first week or two in the clubhouse, what was it you recall about that experience that was so unique? Well, uh, my first unit worker, uh, Samin Reed, actually uh, took me to lunch down in the culinary unit and it was free. You know, and it, it gave uh, Samin and I a chance to, you know, to talk further. Uh, about, you know, because I already chose a unit uh, by, by that time. You know, I was one of those early birds. So, you know, it gave me a chance to really have a, a intimate conversation uh, with, you know, my first unit worker. Uh, and then they, they take you on another tour, obviously, before lunch. So, I mean, maybe back up a little bit. Uh, so you go on an, on another tour, uh, a little more in-depth in a uh, tour, and... Um, you know, you check out the unit that, you know, you chosen, or you, you can check out a few, you know, units in the first week. And can you describe what what do you mean by unit? What is a unit? It's like a, a division of the house that, you know, has a uh, very specific functions. For instance, there's, you know, communication, there's, you know, horticulture, home and garden, uh, research, that kind of thing. So uh, a lot of different things happen in, in the house. Uh, and members and staff all, you know, work together to uh, ensure that that work gets done. Uh, we call it a work order day, which resembles a like going to work. Um, I know um, 
me included, there's been a number of members that, you know, wanted to go back to work, but for numerous reasons, uh, you know, they are timid, you know, they never worked before, or they've been out of work for us for a while. So, you know, being at, at Fountain House and having that work order day structure, uh, you know, helps members to sort of get back into, you know, the routine of, you know, working again. That's well said. I, I, I'm, I'm even seeing that in our little pop-up uh, experience here in, in Hollywood, um, how people are coming out of their shell, taking, like you say, making coffee, making lunch, keeping the place clean and organized. So Josh, um, in the world, how many clubhouses are there? Because I'm amazed that we have so few in California. And what is the criteria for clubhouse membership? Yeah, so there are about 350 clubhouses in 33 countries around the world. About 200 of those are in the United States in about 34 states. Um, and it varies tremendously from state to state, which is largely driven by the degree to which they're funded by states or municipalities in those locations. So um, we see where there's good funding, there's um, there are more clubhouses, and obviously the reverse is true. Um, in terms of becoming a member, it, it varies from clubhouse to clubhouse. Now, Fountain House um, limits it specifically to people with a serious mental illness diagnosis, and it uses the Axis one diagnoses, which are schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, bipolar disorder, and major depression. Obviously, a lot of people have other uh, mental health and or substance use disorder diagnoses as well, and um, certainly those people are, are served as well. Um, some clubhouses um, do not, uh, they just uh, sort of open to anybody. Um, I would say that the, the vast majority of people served in clubhouses are people with serious mental illness. And so you mentioned that 34 states um, and, and, and it hasn't spread throughout the country, probably largely driven by funding issues. And, and I know the study that we're gonna talk about in a moment is gonna make a case to open up funding for what is clearly um, results that re re result in outcomes for people that are very significant. But what would be the kind of range of how clubhouses are funded in America, but for, probably from philanthropic to government involvement and everything in between? Yeah, so it is a, uh, me me every state has a Medicaid program. So. You know, a majority of people with serious mental illness are covered by Medicaid. And so uh, that is obviously the, the largest single determinant of whether uh, clubhouses get funding. And every state is different um, in terms of how its Medicaid program operates. And so that means that every state has an option um, because there is an ability, their Medicaid authority does exist to cover clubhouses as one of the psychosocial rehabilitative services that Medicaid can cover. However, many states do not. And then even if Medicaid does cover it, there's still a wide array of arrangements. So some cover it paying in 15 minute fee for service increments, um, which is not really how clubhouses operate. They're really, you know, I sometimes say Fountain House uh, basically has no fees and it basically has no services, right? It is a holistic therapeutic model. And so that can be very challenging because then you have to figure out how do you document each of those things. Some states like Ohio fund it on a uh, up to a per diem basis. And then um, there are states like Oregon, which uh, funds it on a per member per month basis or even an annual capitated basis. And that is a much more holistic approach. There are also states that through Medicaid waivers are looking for other ways to fund it and use more value-based payment arrangements, which we can talk about later. There are also other ways that clubhouses are funded though. So in New York City, there is funding directly from the city. There's a contract that the city has. And so that means that there are actually um, in New York City, about 15 clubhouses. However, because New York State does not fund it through Medicaid, there are no clubhouses in the rest of the state. There is actually one that just started up this uh, in the last month or two in Poughkeepsie, but it, it just shows you that how much the funding really affects whether there are going to be clubhouses in a particular location. 
And then some states use other mechanisms, like Massachusetts, again, has a contract with clubhouses in Massachusetts. Of the various states um, that have the different approaches, which one would you say at this point is the most ideal with respect to supporting the, the outcomes of the clubhouse model? Well, I think that in terms of what is currently in place, I mean, something like Oregon, where you were actually saying, um, we're going to give an amount per member per month or uh, on an annual basis based on the number of people that are uh, getting served by that clubhouse, because that provides flexibility for the clubhouse to achieve outcomes that basically are, are kind of person centered. Um, obviously, a per diem is better than a 15 minute fee for service increments um, being used as the way to, to designate payment. However, even that isn't necessarily encouraging everything that we want in the sense that, um, you know, Phil said, well, hey, I, I wanted to go back to work or something like that. Well, we don't want to create incentives that uh, for the people who do want to go back to work or do want to go back to school or whatever it might be um, to, uh, you know, that sort of disincentivizes the clubhouse from encouraging that. Now, I say disincentivizing clubhouses don't, you know, don't use that as a way of oh, we don't want you to move on or something like that. But just in terms of a payment model, you want it to be rational. That makes sense. So if somebody was able to achieve a particular aspiration to get a job and they have to work three days a week, which are the days they can't come to the clubhouse, the, the clubhouse should not be penalized for that. That's actually a positive outcome. <laughs> so That's that right. kind of leads us into your research, because I know that you um, are pretty passionate about trying to tell the story of how much this does make an impact and, and to make a case for funding. And so the research that you recently released has, has offered up some pretty startling findings with respect to how much money uh, is saved in like the public system for, for people who are actually active members of a clubhouse. So can you kind of generally describe the outcomes of your recent research? Yeah, what we wanted to do was to think about how do we capture the full impact in economic terms on society? Now, you know, I will say first off that you know, the biggest impacts are the impacts on, on people's lives. And we can talk more about that as well. But we did want to sort of make the economic argument. And so to do that, a year and a half ago, we started building this economic model to capture five different kinds of costs. So they're mental health costs, physical health costs, disability costs, productivity costs or lost wages, and criminal justice costs. And we compiled, uh, based on all the evidence that exists in the literature, what are you know, what what can we pull from all the different studies that exist, dozens and dozens of studies, um, on the impact of clubhouses. And from that, we came up with this model that put all those five categories together. And what we found was that for the average person served by a clubhouse, it saves over eleven thousand dollars a year to society. Um, it is even more, for example, for people with schizophrenia. Um, and so we, we had a couple different examples. We actually have built this dynamic dashboard that eventually will make public. But um, th the idea is that you can sort of uh, use different criteria to sort of understand the impacts. The, the whole point that we were trying to make is that um, when we think about the impacts, we, we don't think it should just be limited to the direct medical costs. You know, that is absolutely, I mean, there are huge economic benefits just from that. However, when you think about what it costs to taxpayers, what it costs to state and federal governments, those five categories I mentioned are all things that, that accrue to the purchaser of healthcare. And so that was really the goal behind this model. So and you're, you make the assertion that um, since clubhouses only serve about 60,000 people in the U.S., with serious mental illness, that this amounts to an annual savings of seven hundred million dollars in mental and men, in mental health and healthcare costs, or across the spectrum of those five domains. The, the five categories, right? Mm -hmm. And then you say, if we expanded to serve just five percent of the U.S. population uh, with serious mental illness, it would amount to a savings of eight point five billion dollars a year which was stunning to me because 5% seems like a rather modest goal. Like, let's make it 50%. But I suppose we would be happy just to get to 5%. Can you elaborate on how much of a challenge this has been to, to expand this model? 
Yeah, I mean, the challenge is really because of the payment systems. You know, there just are not a lot of um, supports for organizations that are trying to build clubhouses. And I know, Gary, you've been trying for a long time in LA and finally gotten it off the ground. But it wasn't easy, right? right. And um, I think that's what, what happens. Not only getting them off the ground, but then maintaining them. Um, I should have said, you know, a, a significant portion of every clubhouse's funding is, is private philanthropy um, because the even, you know, even in New York City where we have a contract, you know, only about half of our revenue comes from public sources. The, the, the other half comes from private philanthropy. Um, Phil, I see that you want to add to this uh, to this thread here. Uh, very briefly, I just want to say, like, if you can create outcomes that will, you know, keep uh, uh, people living with uh, serious mental illness out of the hospital, uh, that is a win-win, I believe, for for everybody uh, involved. You know, governments, uh, you know, staff members of clubhouses, like you know, you name it. Um, and find a house definitely has kept me like out of the hospital. And when I mean hospital, I mean, um, like inpatient, uh, because, you know, inpatient services, uh, my experience with them is that, you know, it has not been helpful at all. You know, I get medicated, you know, I'm told a bunch of, you know, quote unquote, psychobabble. It's really not helpful. I don't get that when I go to the clubhouse. I feel, you know, validated. I feel valued. I feel heard. And I have a sense of community uh, that is still strong to this day, probably even stronger. So I'll end by saying the same thing I said earlier. You know, if your goal is to keep, you know, people with SMI out of the hospital, uh, you have done, you know, the whole country a great service. I love that. I was I yeah. was looking for some of those kind of actual examples of how how this translates. Yeah, I, 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 Phil makes a really important point. I mean, you know, at at the best, a hospital is going to maybe help stabilize someone, um, and in many cases, it, it's not even successful in that. Um, but a hospital is not going to contribute to recovery uh, in any meaningful way. And I think um, in, because that's that's a process that that takes time um, and. I think, you know, when Phil talked earlier about the impact on quality of life, you know, that is a real, what we might call recovery outcome. And, you know, when we think about forms of psychosocial rehabilitation, we, we can't get to rehabilitation until people have gone through some sort of recovery. And so those, those ways that we think about what is the impact of quality of life or s features like that, that really tells us that someone is, um, is uh, on the road to recovery is is making progress in their goals, and then through that they can build confidence in in, in making other kinds of progress. I would also say that um, because we were talking about uh, and, and Phil mentioned staying out of the hospital, you know, it part of it is that you know, I think, and you know, Phil, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but. You know, I think a lot of people with serious mental illness have a lot of reason not to trust the healthcare system. And one of the things that happens is that we see that when people engage in clubhouses, they develop a trust, a, they, a trust in their community. And so that community helps them to think about how they can access the healthcare system and facilitates access to that healthcare system in a much more supportive way. And that is really important. You know, I, I was talking about the full range of costs. You know, the physical health costs um, for people with serious mental illness are are, are huge. Um, you know, people with serious mental illness die about twenty years earlier than the general population, and so and and some of that is mental health issues, and some of that is physical health issues. And again, some of it is because of a lack of trust in the healthcare system. So creating that trust is really important. There was an NYU study that. Uh, looked at the impact of Fountain House on costs, Medicaid costs, and found that compared to a high-risk SMI population, we reduced costs by 21%. Now, that's uh, certainly impressive on its own. It also masks some underlying shifts in how people are using the healthcare system. So it's actually a 35 to 45% reduction in hospitalizations and ER visits 
it's slightly offset by the fact that people are more likely to get uh, primary care, outpatient mental health, and greater use of pharmacy because they're more likely to, um, to adhere to medication regimens. Again, I think this is ultimately a lot about trust and, and engagement. So I don't know, Phil, what do you think about that? Um, I also like to add that um, uh, th there was a study done in uh, 2021 by the, the National Institute of Health that says that uh, there has been a 40% increase uh, in persons seeking out uh, mental health services. And that was due to, you know, the onset of COVID. Uh, so when, you, when I think about that, you know, I think, wow, you know, the more importance of having, uh, you know, institutions and facilities like, like the, like Fountain House, like uh, other clubhouses that really uh, tap into, uh, you know, the frustrations that people have been having uh, the past couple of years uh, about, you know, their life in general, uh, you know, mental health in particular. Some of them uh, haven't experienced the level of mental health challenges that they did, you know, before COVID. And then for some people like myself, you know, you know, the physicalities of COVID has said that, you know, long COVID or long Holler syndrome, you know, some of us have those residual. You know, Phil, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the the impact of COVID and, and the isolation that we all experienced. We, we all experienced and I think have a hopefully more empathy for that, that feeling. And um, the report does address the fact that the clubhouse model helps to avoid social isolation. And I'm, I'm curious also about this notion of recovery, because, you know, I'm a lay person, I'm not a clinician, I, I'm not in, I'm, you know, you know, Josh, you said you, you did not necessarily, your career was not in the behavioral health space. My career was managing a business improvement district, like, like Times Square, that's what I did. But um, I'm learning a lot um, as a community member, and I always like to translate these concepts to the people who listen to this podcast because we need to broaden understanding. But you talk about recovery, and I I used to um, be confused by this because I I did not think about recovery in a mental health from a mental health condition the same way I might think of recovery from. Um, from a, from a disease that you have remission from, complete remission or recovery from a heart attack. But um, I've, the way it's been defined for me, it's like reclaiming your life back again. There will be setbacks, but you're not abandoning your dreams and aspirations for your life. Now, I just said what I have come to define it, but um, Phil, 10 years now into this clubhouse, you said that it really, really changed your life. How would you describe what recovery means? I would describe recovery as, you know, I mean, yeah, I have a bunch of setbacks and I was afraid I was gonna be judged for, you know, a lot of the things that I was engaged in that wasn't healthy for me, you know, whether that's, you know, drugs or certain people. Mm -hmm. But Fun House became that community for me where you know, we understand, you know, where you're at right now and we meet people where you're at. We understand that it's a process. It does not mean that you're not in recovery. One of the first things I learned uh, in my Recovery Coach Academy training, they define recovery as when you say you are, not, you know, the clinician, not, not even anybody else from the clubhouse. Like you define when you are in recovery. That's very powerful that I can define, you know, my own recovery, even if I slip up, that's powerful to this day. Like I cling on to that, you know, as a source of you know, inspiration, you know, found houses is, is an epitome of this, you know, recovery strength based model that, you know, you know, meeting people where they're at, you know, at even given day, you know, for some of us who moved away from New York City like I have, that connection is still there. We didn't lose that connection. You know, it is still there. And that's another thing I want to mention in closing on this section is once a member, always a member, no matter where you are, there's still that bridge that you can cross over, you know, and should, you know, when I return to the city in a couple of months, you know, the clubhouse will be there and I could walk through the doors like I never left. To me, that's, that's community that, uh, will never be be severed because we're so 
members and staff are so tight knit. I love that. And I love that notion of your own personal agency and describing how it is that you define recovery. And that's what matters. So, Josh, in the report, um, it mentioned that in the United States, we typically focus more on clinical care and housing with respect to providing services to people with serious mental illness. And we're missing this, what we would call the community-based support and, and even this emphasis on recovery, which I can imagine because the federal government and how how um, services are reimbursed and documented, it, it seems a bit intangible to to check a box to say, Phil has established now that he's on his recovery path. So that should be reimbursed. That should be paid for. What is the challenge as you're thinking about shifting public policy um, to create viable attachments as to why funding should be attached to what I, I guess I would call, I would call it less quantitative measures and more qualitative measures? Yeah, I think it's a combination of things. So yeah, there are things that we have to figure out new ways. We have to be creative in how we measure. Um, and we have to make sure that we are touching on the things that really get at people's recovery. So for example, at Fountain House, we measure member reported outcomes and we use validated survey instruments. Uh, these are instruments that we selected in partnership with our members. As, as Phil described, everything is a partnership. So when uh, you know the research team was trying to decide what measures we should collect, we brought a bunch of uh, survey, first, you know, measurement constructs and then survey instruments and so forth. And a lot of measurement um, that did, most measurement didn't ask the person with uh, with the lived experience, but if it did, it was often very symptoms focused. And our members said, you know what, that's, that's not really what we, that's not how we define recovery. Mm -hmm. And so the, the measures that were selected were first, because so many people with serious mental illness face tremendous economic and social isolation, they said, we want to measure about loneliness. So there's a measure, the UCLA three atom loneliness scale that we use. Um, we actually are working on a paper right now, which will be coming out this spring, which uh, really will show pretty remarkable changes in the level of loneliness that people experience at Fountain House. Um, the second measure is quality of life. So again, one, one of the things that Phil brought up Early in our conversation, there are validated instruments, and we we selected one, and that's something that we use to measure how people are progressing over time. And the third thing is was members said, "Hey, we want something more aspirational." And so we found a measure, a uh, validated survey instrument called the Brief Inventory of Thriving, and it's uh, it's a very interesting instrument. We can make it available to people if you want um, in terms of what the instrument is. But you know, the the point is that. Um, these are the things that um, our members defined as what really constitutes recovery for them. And so those are what I would call the recovery measures. And then we can think about the rehabilitation measures, right? So then we can think about, you know, what are the changes in employment? And we do measure that. And we have you know, much higher employment. Uh, we have much higher educational attainment. Um, you know, we have uh, a lot of people who were unhoused who become housed. 35 to 40 percent of our population have a history of homelessness before they come to Fountain House. Um, and, you know, we could measure, um, you know, changes in recidivism, um, which has become one of the main treatment uh, sources for people with serious mental illness because our, our system has failed, uh, has failed people in so many ways. So there are a lot of those kinds of social outcomes we can include as well. And then we can also, you know, build on top of that some other clinical measures. We can, you know, include some of the, the impacts on hospitalizations and ER visits, et cetera. Well, I guess now that the Surgeon General has declared a national epidemic of loneliness, we have uh, something to hang our hat on if we can try to combat that. Phil, you had mentioned early when we were just getting to know each other that you are a certified peer specialist. And this, again, as I mentioned, I think is a relatively new phenomenon in California and perhaps in other states where people might be listening to this. Can you describe your journey to become a peer specialist? What was that process like? What motivated you? And what role do you play in that capacity? Well, um, when I first moved to New York City in early October 2008, you know, my life was in shambles. I had no idea what my life was going to, you know, 
look like. But, you know, during the course of that fall, I kept hearing words like, you know, peer support, peers. It's like, what is that? I got curious. So, you know, I ask around, um, you know, various, um, you know, support groups I could find. The, the one at the uh, LGBTQ Center in Manhattan was a, a big one uh, where I was under a mentor for a long time. And he was the one, his name is Robert Kaufman. I think he's been an advocate for many, many years. I want to say 40 plus years uh, as a, a Stonewall uh, rebellion uh, advocate uh, and peer supporter. So that's how I got my start, you know. And then eventually uh, through those networks, I've been hearing about, uh, hey, I can become a certified peer specialist. This is a process for doing it. And in New York State is uh, uh, a 13-module, two prerequisite uh course model called the Academy of Peer Services, which was uh, created uh, by the New York Office of Mental Health and Rutgers University in New Jersey. Uh, and that is the, uh, the vehicle, the platform for, you know, peer specialists being trained. And the beauty about this model is that you can take the courses, you know, at your own pace. There's no like set time you have to, to finish them. And the process after that becoming certified through the, the New York uh, Peer Specialist Certification Board is really easy. Uh, it's now, everything is online now. So if you're tech savvy, you know, you can go online and, you know, and submit the application and whatever else is uh, required. So as a, as a certified peer specialist, having achieved this level of certification and education, then are there job opportunities that are opened up to you in this space? What does that look like? Yeah, I've had a, what is called a social enterprise appointment at Fountain House uh, back in 2020 that hired peers to, you know, go to uh, Manhattan Psychiatric Center. And I think that's a Jewish church on the, the Upper East Side to provide, you know, peer support at those, those spaces. There's the peer warm line uh, at Fountain House that, you know, serves uh, found house members from 5 p.m. to, you know, 9 a.m., you know, Eastern time as a space for peer support. So, you know, within found house itself through the Employment Resource Center, there is a whole slew of jobs. Now, outside of that, I've been getting floods of uh, a mail and messages through social media about opportunities for you know, peers to, to get jobs. Most recently, the recharge station, you know, was started. Uh, what, and as what, is, means, what is that, Phil? What is the recharge? Oh, the recharge station. station. So it's, uh, so it's located in Times Square, I think, uh, 45th and Broadway. And it's just a gathering place, you know, people in the community, you know, peer specialists that found the house, they provide, you know, coffee, treats, uh, information, and more importantly, a, a space to uh, create community. I've seen it as well, and I, I found it very impressive also. So Josh, the study that you've done now is something that you really need to get out. I'm hoping this helps, and, and I'm sure there's many avenues that you are working to try to get the, the word out about the, the positive outcomes. What What is your plan to um, elevate the study? You said you're working on this dashboard that I guess we would be able to access at some point. What is your strategy for disseminating these results? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is to make sure that um, people who are driving policy that could create greater opportunities for clubhouses to succeed in states will have access to this information so that they can make the case. Um, we, we often have a lot of people when we meet with people in Washington on the Hill or when we meet in you know state capitals around the country, um, we find that there's a lot of re receptivity. This you know this really resonates, particularly when our members are part of the teams that are uh, going to these policy leaders um, because they really understand when they hear from from members um, what the impact is. And then they have to figure out how they make the case to people on the budget side. And so this is really to complement that, um, to really provide some of that economic argument um, that this could actually be budget relieving and to um, un help them to sort of tie this to more rational approaches to how we think about mental health care in this country. So part of it is to say, um, again, there are all of these economic impacts and 
when you look at uh, not only the, the impact on mental and physical health costs, but all these other costs, there's a huge opportunity to uh, relieve uh, state and federal budget problems, to have an impact in other ways. And also to, to build off of something that Phil was just talking about, you know, one of the reasons why people like Phil are so important is because we have a huge workforce crisis in this country, particularly as it relates to behavioral health. And so peers are a huge opportunity to address that. And in addition to that, so are clubhouses, because clubhouses really are a way that we uh, train people in engagement, right? So people are, are some people do have uh, advanced degrees in social work or psychology, many of them don't. And, and the point is that it, that's not a requirement because what they're really experts are uh, experts at are people who are experts in engagement. And we can really address some of those workforce challenges if we maximize the potential of everybody who wants to help. Um, so some of that is, again, peers, some of that is mental health, uh, non-traditional providers, paraprofessionals, whatever you want to call it. I think what is very wise about your strategy uh, is the fact that you are <clears throat> trying to connect the dots across many states as, as to the need to look at how do we reform pain for these types of psychosocial programs. And I will point out that back in 2020, I did interview um, the CEO at that time, Dr. Ashwin Vassen, who now is I think the chief health officer for the city of New York. And th those were in the early aspirational days of bringing a clubhouse to Los Angeles. And he was talking about the strategic plan that was underway at Fountain House to, to create that kind of national network of clubhouses in other states so you could elevate your voice. It, can you describe why it is important to have a clubhouse in Los Angeles? And, and how will this ultimately be part of this network that you're creating? Yeah, I mean, you know, to think that how few clubhouses are in the, the largest state in the country um, is is really, you know, is really kind of uh, sad. I mean, honestly, um, and I think it's great that that Fountain House LA has started. There are some other good clubhouses in San Diego. There's some starting up in San Francisco. You know, so we want to see that. Um, I think that what really needs to happen is to create. Um, create the conditions for success for them. And that requires us to make sure that we are um, uh, creating this network that can that can address that. Part of the real importance of that network is making sure that we have a really broad set of data. So I was talking about all the different kinds of measures that we collect. We have now trained a network of there are about a dozen clubhouses in seven states across the country that are now um, prepared to start collecting the same data. And so this uh, ne network will actually start sharing data this year. And over the course of the next year, two years, three years, we're going to be able to begin to publish data on, on these outcomes that I mentioned. Again, these recovery outcomes, these rehabilitation outcomes. And, and ultimately, I think that will be really important in showing how this can work in, in places all around the country. And I will point out that the, the Los Angeles Clubhouse is being funded not only by philanthropy um, with generous support from the Hilton Foundation and others, but also a contract from the Department of Mental Health coming from what we would call an innovations bucket out of the State Mental Health Services Act. So it's going to be very important in the four years that that we have this contract for you to be able to document the kinds of outcomes that we're talking about to make a case for policy change in California. Yeah, and to speak to that specifically, there are also going to be some other opportunities because the state has also begun to recognize the value that clubhouses could bring. So uh, there will soon be an option for counties to, um, to fund clubhouses uh, out of using Medicaid dollars. So that's going to be a new op opportunity as well. But that will, because people with serious mental illness are supported in California at the county level, that will require each county to make that decision. So it's really important that um, the people on the ground in California really um, talk to their you know, county departments of public health and, and talk about the importance of clubhouses and the benefits that they can provide. Excellent. So as we draw this to a close, Phil, I want to give you an opportunity. Uh, 
a lot of a lot of people will be listening to this in in California and in Los Angeles. And uh, you are a wonderful spokesperson for the impact that the clubhouse model can have on a person's recovery and and just their ability to reconnect with purpose and their their talents and skills and your accomplishments over the last ten years are pretty breathtaking. For someone who's considering membership, what is the best pitch you would give them if they're feeling a bit ambivalent about whether this is something they should consider? Um, this I'll sum it up this way. Um, you know, when you walk into a clubhouse, you know, you're not going to be alone. Now, uh, you know, there was always someone will kind of, you know, be with you, you know, if you have any questions about uh, anything. So that aspect of, you know, not being alone, not being, you know, isolated, you know, while you at the clubhouse, you know, and given, you know, the trends that happened since COVID, you know, you know, loneliness, isolation, self-abandonment, you know, has become almost like epidemic. That's why I would say to someone who is considering a clubhouse, you know, you will be welcome here. You'll be welcome. Um, the, the welcome mat is uh, open. It's like the uh, Motel you know, 6 you know, slogan. You now we'll leave the light on for you. I love that. I also like the, the Motel 6 slogan is a good one. And then the old Cheers song where everybody knows, uh, yeah, your... Uh, everybody knows your name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> those, those are those are. And I think that's, that's definitely true uh, in my case. Every time I come back to visit, uh, I... You know, there's so many, hey, like, I remember you, like, how have you been, like, at least 30 to 40 people that I talk to uh, every time I go back there. So, you know, that's just a community uh, is still intact. And this is what you get uh, in a clubhouse uh, setting. Yeah, Phil's point is so right on target about the not being alone. It's really... Um, and not surprising at all, because the way Fountain House started was there were a group of people who were leaving a uh, state mental hospital in the 40s who started meeting on the steps of the New York Par Public Library, calling themselves, we are not alone. That is actually how the whole clubhouse movement started. So that's uh, a great way to, to close this out, Phil. Very well said. Well, I will tell you uh, that I'm going to uh, include in the episode notes the link to the study. Uh, and once the dynamic dashboard is available, I can update that, Josh, and we'll include that in the episode notes, along with a, a link back to the original podcast with Dr. Ashwin Vassen in tw from 2020 and just some other resources, including information about the the clubhouse information in Los Angeles. And, and maybe that's the last thing I will let you kind of um, share, Josh. We've been working so closely together for the past year and a half, and it's been so exciting to see the great work uh, Fountain House has done to cultivate the financial support and the plan to launch. And right now we have what we call a pop-up uh, happening one day a week uh, with some inaugural clubhouse members, but I know you're getting pretty close to um, making some staffing decisions and uh, ramping up the plan. What can you tell us we can expect perhaps this summer in Los Angeles? Yeah, so we should have a clubhouse director in place uh, in the next month or so, probably about mid-April. And then we'll have staff coming on board in May, uh, May and June, and then our, we'll be fully operational by July 1st. So that's um, that's really the, the, the goal and the plan. And right now everything seems on track. Um, and so that's that's where it's going to happen soon. Wonderful. I know it this will not be uh it will not be hard to recruit members for this clubhouse. There's a there's a deep need for this kind of community connection, support, everything that Phil was able to so beautifully describe. So I thank you both gentlemen for being here with me today and uh, we look I hope you all both can come out and visit the clubhouse at some point in the coming year. We'll be so proud uh, just to show you around and introduce you to the inaugural members and just share the excitement that this is coming to Los Angeles. Thank you both. My pleasure. Uh, thank you. Uh, what an honor to uh, be in this space. As I mentioned in the interview, we, and by that I mean Heart Forward LA, 
have been voluntarily staffing a pop-up clubhouse one day a week since October here in Hollywood as Fountain House readies its arrival with funding and staff. We are getting close to a more formal opening and we are very, very excited. Already with this Tuesday pop-up, I am seeing the transformative impact of the clubhouse model with our inaugural members in Hollywood. And I know that once this clubhouse is fully open this summer, there will be no problem identifying new members who will be drawn to the opportunity to pursue community, inclusion, and purpose. The message that Josh shares in this interview is critical. Only 34 states have clubhouses operating, and even in New York State, outside of New York City, this is a rarity. Fountain House is leading the way to present research that underscores the positive outcomes on a variety of both quantitative and qualitative measures that make a case for dedicating public funding to the clubhouse model. In Hollywood, apart from the generosity of philanthropy, this first clubhouse is funded by a contract with the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health, which is made available through an innovations grant awarded by the state's Mental Health Services Act. My hope is that as this clubhouse comes to life, other local and state elected officials will come visit and witness firsthand the transformative impact this model has on people in our community. I know the members will be articulate ambassadors to this end. Together, we will need to link arms to make the case that this place of community and purpose is worth the investment so that we can spawn clubhouses throughout all 58 counties in the state of California. Thank you for listening and supporting this podcast. Thank you to my technical producer, Aaron Stern of Verdugo Sound in Glassell Park. There is one final episode to come in this season four of Heart Forward Conversations from the Heart. Stay tuned and see you next time.